today it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Lindsay DiBiase. De uh, she's a faculty candidate for the BTCRI Center for Glial Biology faculty positions. Uh, Lindsay is visiting us from the Intramural uh, NIH in Baltimore. Uh, Lindsay started her career as an undergraduate at Yale, where she did an honors uh, degree in molecular cellular and developmental biology. And uh, she spent two years after that working at uh, Children's National Medical Center as, I assume, a technician, or um, where she's actually published a couple of nice papers where she was working on transcriptome analysis of peripheral immune cells. And then she saw the light and uh, looked to glia uh, when she joined uh, Dwight Burgles at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, for her PhD work. And Dwight had been actively working at these uh, glial progenitor cells called NG2 cells that give rise to oligodendrocytes. And there were all kinds of uh, interesting ideas floating around as to how they communicate with neurons, form synapses, how they were initially excitable, form action potentials, and the role of glutamate receptors in their differentiation and development. So in a series of uh, uh, three papers uh, using uh, transgenic animals, uh, she put to, to, to rest a few of these hypotheses that had been developed in culture system, for example, the role of NMDA receptor activation being involved in oligodendrocyte differentiation. She used the transgenic that conditionally deleted the NMDA receptor in our one subunit and showed that, in fact, glutamate was, the NMDA receptor was not involved in oligodendrocyte uh, differentiation, but made some other interesting discoveries in these papers uh, about the relationship of these oligodendrocytes to axons and the signaling involved. And, how the sodium channels actually go, go away over development. The, the key point I want to make is that she's actually uh, used and learned imaging, electrophysiology, and uh, uh, transgenic uh, uh, animal usage and uh, cell biology. And really, uh, you'll see some of the electrophysiology carried forward here. Oftentimes, we think about real biologists not knowing biophysics and not being able to do electrophysiology. That's not the case for her at all. She's a hardcore uh, neuroscientist. She turned to a different glial cell uh, for her postdoc uh, with uh, Antonello Bonzi, uh, where she spent the last uh, four years looking, five years looking at microglial cells. Microglia, as many of you know, have for the longest time been thought to be sort of the scavenging macrophage of the brain, but they're really hot right now in neuroscience because we think that they're involved in synapse pruning and uh, synaptogenesis. Um, but we've also assumed because of they're all deriving from one common stem cell uh, in the yolk sac, that they're all the same and they all do the same things. And uh, she's going to talk to us about today how she's, her, her recent work that she's published in Neuron challenges this idea where, in fact, she shows that uh, there, are re there are regional differences and those are actually conferred by the particular region in which the microglia uh, reside rather than intrinsic to the microglia. And I'm not going to uh, give any more details about her Neuron paper on that topic. Uh, she's uh, 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 being re the recipient of a recent NARSA award, a uh, Young Investigator Award, that uh, triggers in 2018. So wherever she goes, I think this NARSA award is going to travel with her. She's been extensively mentoring undergraduates and graduate students in the laboratory. She has fairly extensive uh, preparation for teaching. I counted about four or five different courses on teaching courses that she took, and she's been involved actively in teaching uh, graduate-level courses. So without further ado, uh, midbrain microglia, unique cell phenotypes, and their impact on neural function. Lindsay. Great meeting. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, and I definitely want to thank the members of the search committee for inviting me here uh, to share my research with you today. I'm looking forward to all your questions and your feedback. Um, given the strength of glial research that's here at Virginia Tech already, I assume that most of you appreciate the importance of studying non-neuronal cells within the central nervous system. But just to underscore that point, I want to start with a really brief comparison of neuronal and non-neuronal cells within the CMS. We know that the brain contains millions of neurons and that these cells are anatomically specialized. So they're receiving input from thousands of other neurons and signaling at these specialized junctions, synapses. Um, the strength of these synapses can be modified by experience, either strengthened or weakened. 
and that's thought to be an important mechanism by which information is stored within the CNS. Of course, these cells are also electrically excitable, so they're going to integrate input from their thousands of presynaptic signaling partners and make a decision about whether or not to generate an action potential and convey that electrical impulse uh, to downstream signaling partners, often in very distant target sites. So given that these cells have um, a mechanism for storing information and that they are capable of forming complex electrical circuits similar to what you would find in your computer that can process information and carry out a number of different functions, can we hope to have a complete understanding of brain function by studying neurons alone? Well, they're not the only cells in the brain. There are a number of non-neuronal cells and these glial cells, by comparison, tend to be much smaller. With one exception, they don't form synapses. They're not electrically excitable in the same way as neurons, so they can't generate action potentials. And they're not typically sending long-range projections to distant targets. So it's probably not necessarily surprising that for many years, functional contributions that these cells were making were largely overlooked, and they were mainly considered to be providing structural support within the CNS. Is that the whole story? It's certainly worthwhile to note how abundant these cells are. So glial cells are making 70 to 90% of the cells in your brain. And we have to remember that the brain uh, and, and the spinal cord, that these are organs, um, not necessarily computers. Um, they have very specific, uh, the CNS has very specific needs for oxygen, nutrients, removal of waste, defense against infectious entities and really needs to exhibit a pretty remarkable um, resilience to a number of different types of insults and challenges throughout the working lifespan. So we've come to appreciate that glial cells are really critical for these aspects of CNS function, and for that reason alone, it's really critical to understand functional contributions that these cells make, how they influence viability and health and um, resilience of, uh, of surrounding neurons. In addition to that, we've also learned uh, more recently that there are a number of additional ways that glial cells can influence neuronal function that are particularly relevant when thinking about information storage and circuit function. So there are mechanisms by which glial cells can influence synapse formation and synapse stability and elimination, ways that glial cells can influence uh, expression of neurotransmitter receptors by neurons, um, and ways that they can influence uh, functioning or expression of ion channels and transporters that are relevant for um, membrane excitability of neurons. So as a field, we're really still at the very beginnings of understanding this sort of dialogue between glial cells and neurons, but it's going to be very critical for us to understand this sort of interaction to have a complete understanding of brain and circuit function. So. Um, the particular population of glial cells that I'll be telling you about are microglial cells, and we got a, ni as a, a nice little bit of an introduction from Dr. Sonheimer. Yes, these cells are um, frequently known uh, as the macrophage-like immune cells within the CNS, and that does capture some key important aspects of their functional roles. Some additional features of these cells that I want you to be aware of as we go forward, they are ubiquitous, so they're found throughout the brain and spinal cord. With advances in two-photon in vivo imaging, we learned that in the healthy brain, microglia are not just sitting there static, but they're continually extending and retracting their processes into the extracellular space. Um, and in a certain sense, this makes them some of the fastest moving cells within the CNS. In keeping with this fast nature, these guys really are rapid responders to a wide range of um, insults and perturbations to the CNS. So this could be anything from an infection to a stab wound, traumatic brain injury, the initiation of a disease process. And when microglial cells are responding to um, CNS insults and perturbations, they'll undergo um, very dramatic changes in their phenotype, um, their proliferative state, motility state, and release of a number of important signaling factors. Whether or not this response ends up being um, protective or detrimental is still something that's not completely understood. There appears to be um, some ways in which initial responses of these cells can be protective, kind of limiting the spread of injury, um, but they certainly can uh, be more problematic over the long term, potentially contributing to more chronic inflammation. So similar to their um, macrophage counterparts in other tissues of the body, these cells can, um, under, they can engage in phagocytosis, and that's something that's certainly important for removal of pathogens like virus and bacteria, um, as well as cellular debris. More recently, we've learned that microglia are also capable of phagocytosing presynaptic terminals. 
Um, and as Dr. Sondheimer said, this is something that's really important early in development when synapses are overproduced and have to be refined back to um, adult levels as part of synaptic pruning and circuit maturation. It also appears that this is something that's occurring um, during pre-symptomatic stages of neurodegenerative disease and virally induced um, cognitive uh, problems with cognitive function. Um, so this, is, this was really surprising for the field to learn that there's a potential mechanism by which these cells can be shaping synaptic connectivity of surrounding neurons. And the last thing um, to keep in mind is that these cells release a whole host of, of soluble signaling factors, um, and this includes trophic factors, as well as both pro- and anti-inflammatory signaling factors. We've known for a long time that microglia can release these kind of factors in pathological contexts, but more recently we've learned that um, many of these factors can also be released under more much more physiological circumstances, um, and many of these factors can influence things like synapse formation and elimination, um, expression of neurotransmitter receptors, and, and functioning of ion channels and transporters that influence membrane excitability of neurons. Um, so again, an intriguing way in which these cells may be shaping um, key aspects of neuronal function. So together, um, uh, I would say that given these features of microglial cells, uh, if we want to have a complete understanding of the functioning of any circuit, uh, we certainly need to clearly understand functional contributions that these cells may be making. Now, the particular circuit that I'm really interested in, uh, looking at interactions between microglia and neurons, uh, is the basal ganglia or mesolimbic dopamine system. Here I'm just showing you a key population of neurons within these circuits, um, the dopamine producing neurons, because these guys are just really uh, beautiful. Um, and you can see with immunostaining against um, a microglial specific cell surface marker, the abundant microglia in and around this particular population of neurons. So very briefly, what are the basal ganglia? These are a collection of deep brain nuclei. I'm showing you here in coronal sections from human and mouse, obviously not drawn to um, real life scale. Um, the striatum, both the dorsal striatum and ventral striatum, or nucleus accumbens, is considered an input nucleus for these circuits. Neurons in this brain region are receiving input about cues in the environment, as well as cues about the internal state of the organism. They're also receiving information about value um, and reward or salience from dopamine-producing neurons in the ventral tegmental area and substantia nigra pars compacta. So the striatal neurons will integrate this information um, and then either directly or indirectly influence the activity of neurons in output nuclei of the basal ganglia, including the substantia nigra pars reticulata, in order to influence behavior. This is not a complete list of the nuclei that make up the basal ganglia, but I want to highlight these nuclei because this is where I've carried out the majority of my uh, analysis of microglial cells. So the behaviors that these particular circuits are involved in are behaviors that we refer to typically as motivated or goal-directed behaviors. And a lot of these behaviors um, tend to be evolutionarily conserved um, and play critical roles in survival of the organism. So, um, Basal ganglia circuits are involved in planning and executing behaviors necessary to obtain food, planning and executing behaviors necessary to obtain a mate, as well as planning and executing behaviors to avoid negative outcomes or aversive stimuli. Another way of appreciating the importance of these circuits is considering some of the consequences when there's some kind of dysfunction within these circuits. So dysfunction of basal ganglia circuits is associated with the development of addiction, as well as a number of um, other psychiatric illnesses. Um, certainly, uh, it's, um, dysfunction is involved in the very prominent motor and cognitive symptoms that accompany degeneration of neurons within these circuits, and also um, with a number of changes, more subtle changes in movement and cognition that occur during the course of normal aging. Yeah. In specific nuclei, yes. Yeah, that's definitely one of a, a very prominent anatomical difference. And it's, it's um, as, as you are seeing, it's something that you can pick up kind of almost right away uh, without even quantification. So a lot of um, research effort has been uh, devoted to trying to understand functioning of these circuits, both in um, health and disease. I'm just showing you here the number of papers over the last 20, uh, 10 or 20 years in PubMed looking at some aspect of neuronal function within these circuits. 
by comparison, very little attention has been paid to what functional contributions microglial cells may be making within these circuits. And really, um, there's a lot that's just not known about basic properties and features of microglia in, in a number of these brain regions. So that really brings us face to face with a key fundamental unanswered question within this field, which is to what extent are microglia really equivalent throughout the CNS? Um, probably largely because of the fact that they are ubiquitous and they've been associated with this sort of classical immune surveillance. It's generally been assumed that microglia are probably more or less the same throughout the brain. Um, but uh, certainly as the basis for um, long-term ongoing studies, I didn't want to make any assumptions that what we've learned about microglia in hippocampus or cortex, for example, and the ways that they interact with neurons in those brain regions are necessarily going to hold true um, for microglia in these brain regions. So one of the um, major things that I did during my postdoc, which I'll um, be the first thing that I'll tell you about, is um, a series of studies that I undertook to um, define the basic properties and functional states of microglia within key regions of the basal ganglia. And uh, what I hope to convince you of is that they are, in fact, not equivalent throughout the CNS, but they show a surprising degree of regional specialization in their um, basal phenotype across these nuclei, even in the absence of any sort of perturbation. I'll tell you also a little bit about what I've been able to learn about how this regional specialization comes about. What are the regulatory cues that, um, that give rise to this regional heterogeneity of, of microglia? And um, certainly the fact that they do have this regional specialization of their basal phenotype raises questions about whether microglia that have distinct basal phenotypes are going to respond uh, the same way when there's some sort of stress or perturbation um, of the system. And so I'd like to also tell you a little bit about some work I've done looking at um, changes in the phenotype of these cells during the course of normal aging that I think hint that this might be the case, that these different basal phenotypes are not always going to respond the same way when the system is challenged. So digging in and looking at basic properties and functional states of these cells, um, I've been largely using a transgenic mouse that expresses um, GFP specifically within microglial cells. Uh, and unless I tell you otherwise, these are studies that are carried out in young adult mice, so mice that are about two months of age. I started just by looking at um, anatomical features of these cells. So coming back to the, the issue of density, um, if we just look at the distribution of microglia in nucleus accumbens, VTA, ventral tegmental area, and substantia nigra pars compacta and pars reticulata, even without quantification, you can see that there are differences in the abundance of these cells across these nuclei. So with quantification, there's um, a lower density of microglia in the VTA, a remarkably high density of microglia within the reticulata. And what you see in the accumbens is roughly equivalent to what you would see maybe in cortex or hippocampus. If we zoom in and look at the um, fine process branching of these cells, there's a much sparser branching of microglia in the VTA and the compacta, and a much more complex branching structure in the accumbens and the reticulata. Um, which I've been quantifying just by looking essentially at the percent coverage of the field of view by microglial cell processes and somas. So right away, these, just these anatomical observations raise questions about whether, my, uh, whether neurons that are in these different nuclei are going to get exposed to different levels of microglial-derived signaling factors, or whether there are going to be differences in the degree of interaction between microglial cell processes and surrounding structures. Um, I wanted to know whether or not these um, differences in their anatomical features are accompanied by underlying differences in their functional state. So to look at that, I used three different approaches. The first was to look at lysosome content within these cells. So as phagocytotically active cells, lysosome content could certainly potentially give you some hints about level of phagocytotic activity. But lysosomes are also really important for general levels of metabolic activity within a cell. They play important roles in autophagy and organelle turnover, so it could potentially give you some hints about that as well. We can look at lysosomes of microglia um, by using immunostaining for this microglial cell-specific lysosome membrane protein, CD68. And um, I've quantified essentially the percent volume of the microglial cell that's filled by lysosomes. And what I found is that there are significant differences in lysosome content across these nuclei. So VTA microglia have a lower lysosome content. Reticulata microglia have um, a significantly elevated lysosome content. 
suggesting that there may be important differences in either level of phagocytotic activity or potentially level of metabolic activity of microglia across these nuclei. I've also um, looked at the electrical, electrophysiological membrane properties of microglia. The motivation for these experiments is that there are a couple key papers that have shown that when microglial cells undergo a shift in their functional status, there are some accompanying changes in their membrane properties. And for these experiments, I ended up focusing in on um, the immediately adjacent VTA, compacta, and reticulata, where I saw the biggest differences in anatomical features and lysosome content. Thanks to the uh, GFP in these cells, I can actually find microglia in an acute brain slice and target them for whole cell um, recording. If we start just by looking at very basic membrane properties like resting potential and membrane capacitance, which is essentially a measure of cell surface area, the microglia in the VTA and the compacta are pretty similar to one another. Microglia in the reticulata had a significantly more hyperpolarized resting membrane potential, um, indicating that these cells likely have important differences in, in ion channels that are open at rest. Um, and also had a significantly elevated membrane capacitance, which is consistent with the anatomical observations we made that those guys have more complex and extensive branching um, patterns. I also wanted to look at whether these cells have voltage activated conductances, because that was one of the most important changes that was observed when these cells undergo a shift in their functional status. Um, again, the microglia and the VTA and the compacta responded pretty similarly and very passively. So if I hold them in a current clamp and inject hyperpolarizing current or depolarizing current, not much happens. Um, if I hold them in voltage clamp and step them to different holding potentials, very passive responses. The microglia in the reticulata showed evidence of voltage activated conductances. If I inject depolarizing current or hold them uh, in voltage clamp and step them to depolarized potentials, it's not all of the cells that showed these responses, but really the majority um, did show these voltage activated conductances. And I would rarely, if ever, see these responses in microglia in these other brain regions. Additional um, pharmacological experiments indicate that these are mediated by voltage activated potassium channels. So we don't know exactly what it does for uh, the behavior or the, or the biology of a, a microglial cell when it's expressing voltage activated um, potassium channels. Um, there are some hints that this may be linked to aspects of their motility, which I think is a really intriguing possibility, but that, that still remains to be um, clearly demonstrated. But um, certainly, um, regardless of that, it, it's another piece of evidence that even um, in the absence of some sort of perturbation, microglia in immediately adjacent nuclei can be in very different functional states. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have, uh, they have an incredibly high input resistance. Um, I, haven't, I haven't calculated that, but um, you know, every cell I patch has you know, Vigo input resistance. So I was so. kind of curious about, <coughs> in terms of identifying these conductances, if you know particularly where these channels are located on the cells and if there's a complex uh, morphology, what's the effective space plan for these experiments? I mean, based on the input resistance, I'm, I'm, I would assume that I have very good uh, ability to, to clamp the cells, but I haven't, I haven't tried to uh, dig into that. It would be really interesting um, and potentially helpful in figuring out the functional role of these channels to know where they are uh, on the cell, if they're predominantly somatic or out in the process. You know, you know, I have transcriptome level data, um, but not, not any idea about subcellular localization at this point. Would love to, would love to know that. So the last thing that I did to get in um, and look at uh, potential regional differences in, in functional state of these cells was to look at gene expression um, using whole transcriptome RNA sequencing. So the way um, we went about this was I developed a protocol um, to purify microglia from these, these regions of interest. Um, the approach is just to prepare acute brain sections the same way that you do for electrophysiology. Um, I then carried out a, a purely mechanical dissociation, and, and the whole protocol is done at four degrees to keep these cells um, really very calm during the, the isolation procedure. We can then um, isolate the cells uh, through fact sorting on the basis of their GFP expression, and then isolate RNA and, and perform whole transcriptome RNA sequencing. If we look at um, well-known or recently identified microglial-specific genes, you get good expression of these genes in, in all of these regions. 
and we're not seeing expression of neuron-specific, astrocyte-specific, or oligodendrocyte lineage-specific genes. So what can this data set tell us about how similar or different microglia in each of these regions are? One way of going about that is just looking at the number of significantly up or down regulated genes uh, when you compare microglia from any two regions to one another. So if you do that for microglia from the uh, cumbens and the cortex, uh, you compare them, you really don't find very many genes that are significantly up or down regulated. So those populations of microglia are very similar to one another at the level of the transcriptome. You find a slightly larger number of genes when you're looking at the nigra microglia, but the real standouts here were the microglia from the VTA. So consistently, you find the largest number of significantly upregulated and the largest number of significantly downregulated genes when you compare VTA microglia to accumbens microglia, cortex microglia, um, or nigra microglia. And I'm sorry, I apologize that I forgot to mention that during the isolation workflow that we were um, isolating microglia from cortex in this instance to allow us to be able to compare to some previously published um, data sets from other groups that looked at cortical microglia. So um, I've done a lot of analysis of the functional families that these genes fall into, and I just wanted to show you a couple highlights. Among these genes that are um, down-regulated in VTA microglia are a number of genes that are associated with mitochondrial function and oxidative phosphorylation. Also, there were a number of genes associated with glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So coming back to the observations about low lysosome content within these cells, I think this potentially raises the possibility that, that these microglia uh, are in uh, a different metabolic state uh, or have different levels of metabolic activity than their counterparts in other brain regions. Nonetheless, uh, among these genes that are sig significantly upregulated in the VTA microglia compared to their counterparts elsewhere, are a number of genes uh, implicated in phagocytosis and phagosome maturation. So I think the fact that you have a, a low lysosome content does not necessarily mean that you're not actively engaging in, in phagocytotic interactions with, with surrounding structures. But um, again, it was, really, it was really quite a surprise for us to find that these VTA microglia were so distinct from their counterparts in other brain regions. So what I've told you about so far um, is just that these microglia uh, in distinct regions of the basal ganglia are different from one another in terms of their anatomical features, their lysosome content, membrane properties, and gene expression. So we really can't continue to consider them functionally equivalent throughout the brain. And in particular, these deep brain microglia, especially in the, the VTA and the compacta, um, were quite distinct from their counterparts in, in cortex and other brain regions. So how, how does this come about? How did microglia uh, come to have such a degree of um, regional specialization in their basal phenotypes. Um, one of the things that we could look at to try and start to get a handle on this is to try and define when it is during development that these regional differences in phenotypes start to emerge. And that was something that I wanted to um, look at, and I need to give you a little bit of additional background that uh, Dr. Sondheimer also already alluded to. Uh, microglia come from different developmental origins than other glial cell populations. So microglia arise from primitive macrophage progenitors in the yolk sac. They invade the developing uh, nervous system during early embryogenic periods. Um, and then those, those progenitors go on to proliferate and colonize um, the mature brain with its microglial cell population. In contrast, um, progenitors for astrocytes and oligodendrocyte lineage cells arise within the developing neuroectoderm, and progenitors that are at different dorsal ventral locations or that arise from different temporal pools have distinct properties. And this ends up contributing to um, a, a portion of regional heterogeneity that's present in mature astrocyte and oligodendrocyte lineage populations. So frankly, um, from a developmental perspective, it wasn't clear whether we should expect microglia to have the same degree of, of regional heterogeneity as other major glial cell populations. So when is it um, that this regional specialization of microglia is, is coming about? Here again, I'm showing you um, density of microglia in a two-month-old mouse. If we take a step back and look at early postnatal periods, so postnatal day six, you can see that microglia are reasonably abundant in these nuclei, but there's no significant differences in their density across these, across these brain regions. Just six days later, we can already see significant differences in their density um, with a pattern that's, that's already beginning to resemble that that's present in the adult. Please note that there are some slight differences in the y-axis here. 
Um, very similar things are going on at the level of the individual cell morphology and branching. So at postnatal day six, you can see some cell to cell differences um, in morphology, but no obvious differences across these regions that would let you know which particular nucleus you're looking at. And by P12, we can already start to see a much more complex branching in the accumbens and the reticulata and a sparser branching in the VTA and the compacta. Um, so this really indicates kind of the developmental time window during which these differences start to come about and argues that the immature microglia need to get into these brain regions and kind of disperse themselves and then there's likely a local cue that's instructing them, okay, you need to adopt a VTA microglial basal phenotype, you need to adopt a reticulata microglial phenotype, as opposed to there being maybe some differences in pools of progenitors that are migrating in and potentially colonizing different regions. So is this um, a, a developmental specification that, that occurs and then the microglial cell phenotype is just set moving forward? Or is there ongoing regulatory input um, to these cells, even in the adult, to help maintain these regional differences in phenotype? To try and look at that, what I did was allow mice to reach adulthood and these regional differences to get established. And I then used either pharmacological approaches or genetic approaches to ablate microglial cells from the CNS, essentially to kill them uh, and get rid of them from the CNS. Um, and here I'm showing you an example using the pharmacological approach. This is actually um, using an antagonist of the CSF1 receptor. Microglia need uh, activation of this receptor to remain viable, so if you chronically antagonize it, you can pretty effectively eliminate most of them from the CNS. They are very resilient, however. If you cease treatment with this drug, um, microglia will then uh, repopulate the brain. So here I'm showing you an example of mice that underwent this ablation and were then given a 21-day repopulation period, and you can see um, that these cells did really effectively recolonize um, these regions. So now we can look and see, are there still in the adult sufficient regulatory cues present to program multiple aspects of microglial cell phenotype? Can they reestablish these regional differences um, in their phenotype? So at the level of density, we can really effectively get rid of the cells. And then if you look at the repopulated microglia, they really effectively um, reestablish a density that's quite similar to that observed um, in control mice. At the level of process branching, same thing. Um, the repopulated microglia reestablish uh, a tissue coverage that's very similar to that in um, control mice. Focusing in on the VTA microglia and reticulata microglia that had the biggest differences in lysosome content, again using CD68 immunostaining, you can see that these regional differences in lysosome abundance were reestablished. And using this pharmacological approach, I can um, carry out these experiments in the microglial GFP mice and then be able to patch from and record from um, repopulated microglia um, and can see that this regional difference in expression of voltage-activated potassium channels is also reestablished following repopulation. So in the naive mice, it was about 65% of the um, reticulata microglia that had these uh, voltage-activated conductances, very similar percentage in the repopulated mice. A little bit higher percentage of microglia in the VTA were also showing these conductances. Um, it's possible that that's simply because I've recorded from a smaller number of cells here. But I think um, another intriguing possibility is that if this channel does indeed play a role in uh, regulating aspects of cell motility, you might imagine that um, there would be a greater degree of uh, motility required during this repopulation event, and this could just be a, a remnant of that. That's pure speculation, but... Um, so, it looks like um, that during early development, uh, microglia need to come into these brain regions and there are likely local cues that are instructing them to adopt these regionally distinct um, basal phenotypes, but that there is ongoing regulatory input to these cells um, to help maintain these regional differences in phenotype. Yes? Yeah, I have not done that experiment. Um, it, this is the, the ablation and, and allowing repopulation is the closest thing to that kind of experiment. Um, in, in, in principle, like, it's, it's certainly a, an intriguing thing to think about, right? Could you, could you do that? Um, I think it's a little bit harder to execute and be able to interpret clearly just because they already start to change their phenotypes so much when you purify them and isolate them. Um, I haven't checked whether 
if you, if you go ahead and isolate microglia from like cortex and, and VTA and then put them in vitro or even just keep them for a brief period, um, to what extent do they maintain those regional differences in phenotype? If they did, then yeah, it might be, um, it might be something that would be intriguing to look at. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, there's a little bit of, uh, it's, it's unclear at this point. There are a couple different ideas um, out there uh, in the field. There was some of the initial experiments using this pharmacological ablation um, proposed that there's actually a population of non-microglial progenitor cells that are dispersed throughout the CNS and that that progenitor population gets mobilized when you eliminate the microglia. Um, but I think the evidence for that is, there, we still need more evidence to really see if that's clearly the case. Um, the other, it, it's been, I think, pretty clearly shown that there's not a substantial contribution of infiltration from peripheral cells. And then the remaining possibility is just that you have um, essentially the few surviving cells because you can't ever completely kill all of them um, would be primary players in that repopulation. And I think based on what, I, what I've seen in my hands, I think that that's probably the most likely possibility, um, that it's really a, a, a quite just pronounced proliferation um, and repopulation from surviving microglia. Um, but it's, it's a great question. So I have, I have looked a little bit at the timeline of repopulation, but I don't think with enough of a, a fine time resolution to be able to address that sort of question. Um, to me, I think, I, I don't think that, that there's any like obvious, uh, there's not an obvious pattern, but if you wanted to know that for sure, I think you would need to do experiments with more careful, closer together time points looking at the repopulation. You mean um, in the absence of a perturbation and in the absence of ablation, is there turnover on an ongoing basis? Um, so I don't know if I see any, um, when they're repopulating, I don't think there's any, I've seen any cell death. So certainly I look to see cell death during the ablation, right, to confirm that the cells had in fact actually been killed and you can you know, see cells that are morphologically clearly undergoing programmed cell death and are caspase 3 positive. Um, but then I don't know during the repopulation, I don't know if there's any turnover that's happening. Is that kind of what you're asking? Turnover at the same time that there's repopulation happening? So no, I don't know about the context of the repopulation. Um, what, in the context of development, uh, it, what you bring up is actually relevant to it. I was, I was gonna tell you briefly just that um, in a project that I don't have as much time to tell you about, um, there's a, a, an undergraduate who worked with me for three years and I mapped out a little bit more completely the developmental colonization of these nuclei. And even after those regional differences in phenotype are established, there is actually a little bit of an overproduction of microglia that seems to peak around like the third postnatal week. And then they do get refined down to adult levels through programmed cell death. Um, similar to other neuroectoderived populations. Whether there's a regional difference in that, um, you know, it does seem like the, the, that may be a little more extensive in, in like the nucleus accumbens, some of these regions where the microglia are ultimately more abundant in the adult, but there is a refinement and a programmed cell death in both um, a region like nucleus accumbens that's, that's more populated and VTA that's, that's less populated. Okay, all right, great. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, certainly that's, that's of interest for sure. Um, in the RNA sequencing data, there's not, uh, you aren't gonna see receptors where there's like 
really extremely highly expressed cell surface receptors that are present on microglia in one brain region and completely absent in microglia in another region. Um, there are a number of receptors that are expressed at sort of intermediate and maybe slightly lower levels that start to fall into that category that I think would certainly be interesting to follow up on. Um, but I don't have any data yet to, to identify. And this actually is a great lead in to um, what I'm about to show you, which is just that, okay, so we know it appears that there's a role for local cues, right, in, in um, the ultimate instruction about how to mature um, for microglia. Um, I don't know yet what the molecular identity of those regulatory cues is, but in thinking about potential local sources for what some of those local cues uh, might be, um, I found the following observation really intriguing. If you look at other cell populations that are present in these nuclei, so the neurons, um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, and astrocytes here using the um, ALDH101 GFP mouse that labels astrocytes with GFP. You can check out density of these cell populations across the nuclei, and I just want to draw your attention to the density of astrocytes, which is also variable across these nuclei with a pattern that hopefully looks familiar. If you compute the ratio of microglia to neurons, microglia to OPCs, this is variable across these nuclei. Ratio of microglia to astrocytes is very consistent across these nuclei. So my astrocytes are about three times as abundant, um, at, but microglia are really establishing a very um, consistent numerical relationship with, with local astrocytes. <clears throat> and the astrocytes have actually already established their regional difference in density at P6. Um, when the microglia have not yet begun to establish their regional differences. So I certainly think that um, it's intriguing to think about astrocytes being in the right place at the right time um, to potentially be influencing microglial cell basal phenotype. There's some intriguing evidence um, in the literature recently about um, interactions between these two cell populations in pathological contexts influencing one another's phenotype. Um, and I would be very interested to try and determine whether that's something that's happening also for establishment of basal phenotypes of these cells. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I know exactly what you're asking. The, like the reticulata, where that density is really high? So certainly the density of, of microglia and astrocytes is very high in that region. Um, it is also, like if you just do DAPI and, and look at total cell number, it will also, that will also have the, the highest cell density. Um, it actually has a lo the lowest neuronal density, though. Um, so it's not, it's not a particularly um, neuron. Uh, it's not a neuron-heavy region. Um, yeah. At least astrocytes and microglia, not OPCs. So OPCs are pretty consistent across all of these regions. And I think that also tells you a little bit about, you know, if you think that there's just something about, like, the, the spatial architecture of the brain region that might limit, I don't know, process branching or, or how many cells can be in there. I don't think that that's necessarily the case because these guys are pretty similar across across all regions. Okay. Okay. So, um, if we have these microglia that have different basal phenotypes, certainly one intriguing question is whether or not they are going to respond differently when there's some sort of challenge to the system. So, I want to tell you about um, how these guys respond during normal aging, um, because it may hint that that could be the case. I initially started looking at microglia in um, in these brain regions in older mice because I wanted to know whether these regional differences in, in their basal phenotype are maintained throughout the lifespan. So here again, you're looking at um, the density of microglia in two-month-old mice. If we step way out and look at mice that are around two years old, which would be roughly equivalent of like an 80-year-old human, you can see that there are increases in microglial cell density in all of these regions. And there have been, um, it has been reported already that there can be slight increases in microglial cell density in, in the cortex of two-year-old mice. Um, so this is something that, that appears to be happening throughout the brain. Um, but what really caught my eye was the magnitude of this increase within the VTA. 
So if you step back and look at mice that are 18 months of age, so now more like uh, late middle age, maybe 65 year old human, um, you can already see significant increases in microglial cell density in the VTA yeah. and the compacta where you're not seeing anything of nearly the same magnitude in, in the accumbens or the reticulata. And this is just um, percent increases in, in microglial cell density that this ends up um, representing. Um, this appears to be happening mainly through local proliferation of the resident microglia. Uh, we can see um, clear indications of morphological divisions as well as BRDU positive microglia um, in 18-month-old 18, 18 mice. So there's a lot of interest in um, neuroinflammation during the course of aging and good evidence that neuroinflammation can have really detrimental effects um, on uh, function of neurons. Um, and cognitive function during aging. Um, microglia are certainly key players in contributing to neuroinflammation. So given this particular increase of microglia within the VTA, I was um, interested to find out what was happening with, with local neuroinflammation. So the first, the way that I tried to look at this, um, at least as a starting point, was to isolate tissue from mice of the same age ranges. Um, again, preparing acute brain sections the same way we do for electrophysiology microdissecting out the VTA, the accumbens, and in this case, um, the PFC, because there is some published data about um, changes in levels of uh, inflammation across the lifespan in PFC. So then um, uh, dissociate the tissue, isolate RNA, um, and in this case, use quantitative PCR to look at key inflammatory signaling factors that um, microglia can be known to release. So looking first just at tumor necrosis factor alpha, in the PFC, you didn't see really pronounced changes in um, TNF-alpha transcript across the age span, um, the lifespan, uh, maybe a little bit of an increase by the time you get out to two years of age. In the accumbens, the micro, uh, the, you actually see a lower level of TNF-alpha um, that is significantly increased by the time you get to two years of age. But again, the real standouts, the standout was the VTA, where you see the largest increase in, increases in TNF-alpha transcript, and these are already significant um, by the time you get to 18 months of age. Uh, found very similar results for another inflammatory signaling factor, IL-1 beta. So certainly there appear to be, um, there appears to be large regional variation in age-associated increases in microglial cell density. Um, and it may uh, not be the case that neuroinflammation during aging is uniform throughout the brain. It seems like there may be some hot spots or pockets where neuroinflammation is arising earlier and to a greater degree. Um, aging is obviously a, a very complex process, um, but I'm intrigued by the possibility that maybe um, the fact that uh, microglia in the VTA had this very distinct basal phenotype to begin with could be contributing to the fact that they're responding differently during aging. Um, there are also a number of things that could be driving um, that particular increase of, of VTA microglia. One thing that I've been following up on um, is actually trying to investigate the possibility that there may be a role for um, these protein lipid aggregates that are known as lipofusin within microglial cells that are really contributing to proliferation of these cells and their production of, of inflammatory signaling factors. Um, and I've developed some approaches uh, predominantly using fact sorting to be able to um, look at this, uh, these protein lipid aggregates in a very quantitative way and also be able to purify that material to be able to more directly test um, the role that this material plays in, in driving changes in microglial cell phenotype. Um, and I'm very happy to talk more with anyone who's interested about, uh, about that work. So uh, hopefully you guys are really convinced that microglia are not equivalent throughout the CNS, that they have this surprising degree of regional specialization uh, in their basal phenotype. We've known for a long time that neurons uh, are in different brain regions, exhibit a large degree of regional specialization and are quite distinct. Um, and it's really uh, very new information to start thinking about the degree to which this is also true for major glial cell populations, including um, microglial cells. I think this, um, this discovery raises a number of exciting questions. Some of the ones that I'm most interested in are, what are the consequences of this regional specialization uh, in phenotype for synaptic fun function of surrounding neurons? Um, are there going to be really important differences in the way that microglia that have these different basal phenotypes um, engage with and influence um, synapses and synaptic function of surrounding neurons? I'm also very interested in continuing to follow this idea of whether or not 
the microglia that have different basal phenotypes are going to respond differently um, when there are perturbations and, and pathological challenges to the system. And I think it's really important to, in the long term to continue trying to identify the specific regulatory cues that are instructing microglia to adopt these different phenotypes. If you can identify those cues, you then potentially have new tools for manipulating microglial cell phenotype. And that could be useful both experimentally in being able to shift their phenotype and, and test more concretely ways in which a particular phenotype is influencing aspects of ongoing synaptic function uh, or neuronal function. But it might also be useful therapeutically. If it turns out that microglia with one particular basal phenotype have um, a greater capacity to engage in neuroprotective responses, you could potentially try to shift microglia towards a more neuroprotective phenotype for, for therapeutic purposes. So these questions, um, I would consider them to be very broad, um, overarching questions that would guide my um, very long-term research uh, objectives. To get started uh, as an assistant professor, I would be drawing on my strengths um, in electrophysiology and imaging approaches to really zero in on this question, um, the extent to which these regional differences um, are having an important uh, influence on synaptic function and focusing in on um, the particular population of microglia that um, my, re my postdoctoral research showed had this very distinct basal phenotype, the VTA microglia. So I want to tell you a little bit more about that research direction. Um, I have some, a couple pieces of evidence suggesting that VTA microglia may be particularly well positioned to interact with and, influencing and influence surrounding synapses. One piece of evidence is that essentially the extent of branching of VTA microglia is correlated um, with the local density of glutamatergic synapses. So the way I can look at this is just, again, looking at microglial cell processes. This is just a single focal plane. You can reconstruct the extent of microglial cell processes in this single focal plane um, and then quantify local density of uh, glutamatergic synapses. Here I've been using um, just immunostaining for vesicular glutamate transporters that are present at the presynaptic terminal. Um, and then look at the relationship between these two things. So I've looked at um, glutamatergic synapses that uh, have vesicular glutamate transporter one, two, and three. And in general, what you see is that um, the degree of microglial cell branching and process coverage is greater when you have more synapses. Um, this is especially true for VGLUT2 and VGLUT3. And this sort of correlation was not observed for microglia in other brain regions like the nucleus accumbens or the substantia nigra pars reticulata. In addition, if we go back to the um, sequencing data, there was this observation that genes related to phagocytosis and phagosome maturation are upregulated in the VTA microglia compared to their counterparts elsewhere. Um, and phagocytosis is one key mechanism by which microglia have been proposed to interact with synapses um, and, and influence synaptic connectivity. Um, I can see a, a number of um, examples of putative instances in which a microglial cell has engulfed a presynaptic terminal um, just under basal circumstances, indicating that it, it is possible that this is something that's happening on an ongoing basis in the adult. So what are um, excitatory glutamatergic synapses in the VTA doing? What are they important for? Um, why should we need to know about how microglia might be interacting with those synapses? One thing that they're doing is providing uh, excitatory synaptic input onto dopamine neurons that reside within this brain region. These are three dopamine neurons that I filled with neurobiotin during recording. Um, and these synapses play an important role in regulating firing patterns of these neurons and influencing dopamine release in target structures. And that's important for these motivated, goal-directed behaviors that, that we talked about. These synapses, the strength of these synapses can be modified by a number of different stimuli, including exposure to a number of drugs of abuse, exposure to natural rewards like sweet foods, um, and also stressful stimuli. And when that happens, we just take um, uh, a single exposure to cocaine as an example. Um, if a mouse has a single exposure to a cocaine and you look at synaptic strength a day later, you can see that it's potentiated. This will last for several days, so still potentiated at four to five days later, but it's ultimately transient. So if you look more at eight to 10 days after a cocaine exposure, synaptic strength has now come back to baseline. And this is thought to be um, an important homeostatic process that's, that's necessary to allow these neurons to be able to continue engaging in plasticity and um, uh, in, in ongoing learning during, during the lifetime. Um, 
the mechanisms that are responsible for this decay of LTP back to baseline have not been fully mapped out. And I was intrigued by the possibility, knowing what we do about microglia um, and some of the preliminary data, that potentially microglia could be playing a role in this bringing excitatory synaptic input back to baseline. <coughs> So to test that, um, I went back to using these ablation approaches. So here just showing uh, an example using a genetic approach, um, which I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested about the specifics of that approach. But essentially eliminating microglia, um, exposing mice to a single IP injection of cocaine, and determining whether or not this influences how long that synaptic potentiation is maintained. The way I'm looking at synaptic strength is something that's um, pretty common in, in, in this field. Um, which is looking at uh, something that's referred to as the AMPA to NMDA ratio. So I will measure um, currents through AMPA type glutamate receptors shown here in light purple and also NMDA receptors kind of in fuchsia. If there's been some sort of stimulus that leads to strengthening of these synapses like exposure to drugs of abuse, typically what you'll see is a big increase in the magnitude of these AMPA mediated currents relative to NMDA currents. So an increase in the AMPA to NMDA ratio. So what I found is if I gave mice um, a single IP injection of cocaine and then looked out at an eight to 10 days later when synaptic strength should be coming back to baseline, if microglia were present, the AMPA to NMD ratio was coming back down to baseline. If microglia were not present, the AMPA to NMD ratio was remaining elevated, suggesting that there may indeed be um, a key role for these cells in influencing um, synaptic strength onto dopamine neurons. So I recently received um, a NARSAD Young Investigator Award um, to start investigating the specific mechanisms by which microglia are engaging in bringing this synaptic strength back to baseline. Um, and this is certainly um, important for trying to understand initial and ongoing responses to drugs of, abu of abuse. Um, but I think that this, this is potentially trying to look at a new cellular player in regulating excitatory synaptic input onto dopamine neurons in general. And I would anticipate that this is not something that would just be happening following cocaine exposure. This would be a cellular interaction that could potentially be relevant for thinking about um, any context where functioning of dopamine neurons and functioning of um, mesolimbic dopamine circuits is disrupted. So that would include other psychiatric illnesses, movement disorders, um, as well as some of the changes in, in dopamine neuron function and um, mesolimbic dopamine function that uh, occur with normal aging. So we're probably, I don't know if uh, if I should go quickly since we had a few questions in the middle, but I just wanted to end by very quickly telling you that I've also been developing some approaches to look at dynamic features of these cells um, because that's very important for a number of the mechanisms by which these cells have been proposed to interact with um, surrounding structures and surrounding synapses. So um, certainly as the glial researchers here are familiar with, you can do this very easily in acute brain sections. Um, and there are a number of groups that have been uh, doing this, trying to tease out specific mechanisms of microglial cell motility, process motility, um, and injury uh, motility. These are some microglia in an acute brain slice in the reticulata, and you can use these approaches to get a lot of information about um, differences in process motility uh, you know, over a total time period or in velocity of process movements. And down the road, in combination with labeling of specific neuronal structures, you could get additional infor information about um, potential differences in uh, degree of interaction with surrounding neuronal structures. Together with Da Ting Lin, who's at um, NIDA, we've also been um, trying to develop just some ways to look at this in vivo as well. Of course, these are deep brain structures, so there's not a non-invasive way to go about this but you can chronically implant um, gradient index lenses in mice, uh, GRIN lenses. And this is just a mouse under the custom imaging setup that we have at NIDA and some histology from a mouse that was implanted with one of these GRIN lenses about three months after the, the implantation. So you can see that there is some, um, certainly some glial scar formation right around the base of the lens, uh, but the microglial cell population in the region that we'd be interested in imaging is, is, looks pretty good. Um, so imaging through this lens, we can also clearly resolve the fine processes of the microglia and over a 30 minute period see um, clear instances where processes are being retracted or um, new processes are being uh, extended. So this could also provide a really powerful way, again, down the road in combination with labeling neuronal structures to be able to clearly look at this as potential mechanisms by which 
microglia are influencing um, surrounding neuronal structures. Um, I want to thank my uh, boss, Anto Banchi, my postdoctoral mentor, and current and former members of the Banchi lab, as well as collaborators who've helped particularly with the, um, the RNA sequencing. Um, and thanks to you guys for your attention. I'm happy to take any additional questions that you have. All microglia express? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Yeah. Do you know about some indications that maybe they don't? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that um, you're right that, that you know um, finding better markers, you know, or additional markers for these cells is it would certainly be useful to, for the field. I think. One thing that I'm constantly thinking about with this mouse um, is that, you know, it provides us with, with really, it's absolutely necessary to be able to record from the cells, and certainly for imaging purposes, it's really critical. But um, it's, it is a knock-in mouse, so you've actually removed one copy of paractokine uh, gene from the, all the microglia, and so it's important to, to know that when thinking about injury responses with these cells. There's some indications that um, Injury responses are not necessarily identical in mice that are lacking one copy of the correct kind of sector. A couple times when you referred to the uh, microglia engulfing the presynaptic yep. channel. And I take that as face validity in it, but I'm just kind of curious, are you, you simply haven't seen or you don't think it's worth entertaining the notion that they also morphologically interact with the dendritic spines postsynaptically? And or might they be affecting things like the amphid and the receptor ratio through something other than physically taking away and eating up the site, mm -hmm. but inducing a shuttling of receptors and mm -hmm. some other things, is that still open? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, based on the, the RNA sequencing data I had about the phagocytosis and that this is, you know, sort of a prominent thing in the field right now, I think that's something that needs to be looked at, but I think there are definitely other ways that these cells could be influencing either synaptic connectivity and or receptor expression, you know, just, just uh, essentially strength of individual synapses. So um, pr the processes of microglia have been shown to um, dynamically contact dendritic spines, not necessarily engulf them, but that contact um, tends to increase the chances that a dendritic spine would be lost over coming days, potentially through um, local uh, changes in an extracellular matrix from like release of uh, um, proteases, or through, um, uh, there's also some indications that microglia can release BDNF and that that might influence spine formation, spine elimination, although it's unclear, you know, to what extent that has to be like processes coming and contacting a dendritic spine. But, you know, these the additional mechanisms, that's um, definitely how I would be structuring that project, would be trying to identify which of these specific mechanisms is really at play here. Um, do you mean is it, can I like ablate them just in one region? Unfortunately, there's not a great way currently to ablate them in only one region. So anytime I'm doing the ablation, um, I'm ablating them brain-wide. Um, so there haven't been, um, as far as I'm aware, and I haven't tried this myself, um, there hasn't been great success at getting microglia, at getting viral. Uh, it, using viral-based approaches to get microglia to express anything. Um, I think one of the challenges of trying to get a region-specific ablation is also just that even if you can ablate them successfully in one region, the surrounding cells are so proliferative that I think you would have only this very, unless you'd be in some way continually um, re-ablating them on an ongoing basis, the surrounding cells are just going to come in really quickly but it would be great to be able to figure out how to do that. 
I mean, there is, um, there is evidence that the dynamic processes themselves exhibit self-repulsion. So if you, um, you know, are imaging processes from two neighboring cells and they kind of encounter each other, they'll um, repulse. Whether or not that um, ends up being the key factor for setting up the position of the soma, um, I think we don't necessarily know yet what, what ends up setting up the position. Yeah, I mean, they are kind of tiled. It is like a little bit of a, a you know, a lattice-like distribution. Um, um, so, and I don't know if I have, the, have this slide here. I mean, I had done some additional morphological analysis where you just do like 3D reconstruction of individual cells. And um, if you'll recall, the microglia in the reticulata, which is really high density, and microglia and nucleus accumbens, which is kind of intermediate density, they actually had the same tissue coverage, very similar levels of tissue coverage. So how does that end up being the case? Well, um, the microglia and the reticulata have very complex branching but a smaller territory. And the microglia and the accumbens have very complex branching but a bigger territory. The guys in the VTA and the compacta that have more sparse branching, um, they do, their processes extend over about the same territory as the accumbens guys, but they're just more sparsely branched throughout that territory. I don't know if that was sort of your, your question. You have to be mindful of time. Oh, sorry. That was why I didn't play. The students can have one. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.